Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to be joined once again by one of our regular contributors, David Perez. David, it's great to have you with us. It's been a little while. Um, how are you doing with lockdown and, and, and how is life for you in, in Latin America right now? Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And well, in general, I've been trying to stay sane. I think like everyone else, trying to, to stay home as much as possible. But it's it ha it, it's not easy for, for, for me, actually, because I'm, I'm very used to seeing a lot of people getting together with my family and that sort of thing. Well, you can do for a while, but you 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 sort of need to to see people, to get together, and video is just not enough. So, well, I, I'm not gonna say that I'm bad because I know that I'm, I'm very, very good in the position that I'm in compared to a lot of other people, but I'm, I'm struggling, and I think like everyone else around the world. Yeah, yeah, so, uh, I mean, there's a few of us have tipped over the edge already, I think, with the, the, the need to see uh, people. Um, yeah, it's one thing to be comfortable, but it, that, that that human contact is something that we all really need and, 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 and are missing right now. And I know we were talking off air about the the indefinite time. And, and, and actually, yeah, if you have a finite amount of time, you can probably cope. But it's that lack of certainty about when things are going to change and how they're going to change that I think is is unsettling for everyone right now. Um, but uh, but aside from sort of personal circumstances, what are the things you're you're, you're seeing in, in in the communities when you are allowed out of out of doors? Well, How are things? Things are very different depending on on each country. Well, as as you guys know, Latin America is composed by twenty countries, and mm -hmm. each one has a different government, and each government has had different reactions to what COVID is and what yes. to do with COVID. So for example, here in Costa Rica, we were able to actually get it very controlled until about two weeks ago when people from Nicaragua who didn't take any action started coming into Costa Rica because they wanted to be treated, to, to, to have healthcare. So our Northern frontier or border right now is actually crowded with COVID cases. It's happening in Costa Rica, I know it's happening across Latin America because I think it was two days ago, I saw an article from the Scientific American stating that we are the new epicenter of the pandemic in Latin America with 1.5 million cases confirmed and 70,000 deaths. 70,000. Is wow. that in Costa Rica or is that in no, Latin, Latin America? No, Latin America as a Okay, whole. cool, thank you, thank you. I was going to say we've we've got 40, we've had something like forty one thousand deaths in the UK, which is you know uh, a position of leadership that I wish we weren't in. Um, so it's not the things. Yeah, You're, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're number one. Yeah, number one. Oh, that's bad. Yeah, that's yeah, bad yeah. though. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> but 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 it, it yeah. In, in all seriousness, it's. Uh, it's, it's significant numbers and we wonder how much has been underreported as well because uh, we were talking off air about what's going on in in, in Brazil um, and what's happening with the you know the the indigenous populations in in Amazonia yeah, that that are you know significantly imperiled by by what's going on right now and there's an awful lot that's going on that that is being used politically as well. So there are, there are sort of underrepresented and underprotected groups that, um, that are being used as pawns in the middle of some of this right yeah. now. It's, 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 a, it's a pretty sad thing to see. Deborah, I know you've got a question. Uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm curious to get an update, um, certainly from Antonio and how Portugal's going and, and also hear from you um, about, you know, how it's going in the UK. But I, I also am curious, after we do that, um, I, I, I'm curious how things really have gone for everybody, but, you know, certainly from the Latin America lens. Um, one thing that we saw when everybody started sheltering at home in the United States is 
the lack of access and how much it hurt, you know, us trying to train our children, educate our children, do our works. You know, we certainly have been nagging and suing and trying to get everybody to be accessible for many years. But then when everybody went home, we also are seeing a record, record number of Americans actually um, self-identifying as being a person with a disability the first time ever. So the corporate, the employers are confused, not exactly sure what to do because they, they didn't prepare. They didn't prepare. And um, so I, I, would, I would be curious how everything's, and of course, everybody knows how things are going in the U.S., not well. <laughs> and the misinformation, we're, you know, even though we're starting to slowly open back up, we feel as, I, and I'm not alone, many Americans feel like we've been lied to so much by the government and the fake news and the, we, we don't even know where the misinformation is coming from that people are afraid to start going out. So we're at what's co what we're considering level two and little openings and stuff going on. But most people are just staying put. And actually, I know friends that are resigning from jobs that are telling them they have to come back. Uh, so there's just really interesting things happening that I certainly wouldn't have predicted. So I, I want to ask that question to David, and, but I was hoping that maybe Antonio and Neil, y'all would answer it. Yeah, uh, I, I know that the states are not doing well, but there's also the fact that the states have a lot of money. So they, they can put money wherever it, it needs to be. In Latin America, we have impoverished governments. It's, it's, it's a fact. We, we don't have enough money to do just a subsidy. But even when it's tried, it's not able to get to the people that actually need it because there's no numbers. Like, El Salvador tried to, to subsidize people staying at home, but they were not able to get them the money because they didn't have a census. So they didn't know who was where or how to get them the money without making people go to one single place all at the same time and getting them all spreading the COVID. So that, that the problem of COVID in Latin America is exacerbated by poverty and there's 30% of our population in Latin America is living in poverty. And how are you going to ask people that need to go out to get food to stay home for extended periods of time? It's absolutely impossible. And add to that, that they don't have access to the internet. They, in some places, don't have access to water. How are they going to do hand sanitizing, social distancing, and all of those things that, that are taken from, for granted in many places it are, are just not a possibility. In, 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 a, in every country in Latin America, there's a place where you can point to that is now suffering because of their impoverished situation. So, so yeah, things, things are bleak because, as, as, I, as I mentioned before, we are the new epicenter of the pandemic, and that's exacerbated by the fact that we are we're impoverished in, in general and our governments are not prepared in any way, shape or form to treat any pandemic. They haven't been able to control dengue for decades. So th this is gonna take time and it's gonna take a lot of effort, I think, from the whole world to actually come up with a treatment or a cure for things to get back rolling in Latin America. Uh, I don't see it any other way. Well, um, um, Portugal is a country that lives a lot from tourism and that uh, has a huge impact uh, in society uh, and in business. And they also um, impact in terms of uh, jobs, mainly uh, for, for women who, who work uh, in many areas uh, uh, in in in, the, in hospitality, um, also work uh, in care homes or 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 do support services for children. So women have been uh, the group that has been most affected by employment uh, uh, in, in Portugal. You now, um, uh, and also uh, groups of women that are particularly vulnerable, because people who, who do uh, support services for restaurants when i say you know cleaning or doing that work that is a kind of a non-permanent work they can work for for multiple employers uh and and they were really 
hit by, by that, so it, it became a very, a very difficult situation. Uh, but but tourism was the one that was seriously, seriously affected. Uh, as you know, Portugal was a kind was in a kind of a boom in terms of tourism, so there was an expectation of creating business in tourism. So there are a, a good number of stories of people who just they were just starting. You no, know, they just do, oh we're going to start a new business next week, okay, and suddenly no way, no customers, lockdown. So they were in the expectation of uh, starting to get some revenue to pay the bills to cover the investment. And as you know, uh, nothing like that was possible. So, um, and then in the sector of hospitality and, and food and restaurants, uh, it's believed that some, some restaurants will, will never open again uh, because there's no way that they c the, the, the owners uh, can support the the costs. Uh, with, they were able, uh, the government was was providing support during the last couple of months, but they are not going to be able to continue that financial support for business forever. And because you now, even if society is opening and now you are able to go to a restaurant under certain conditions, uh, people uh, don't seem to people seem to prefer to stay at home. And, and not to get out as they used to do in the past. And, and of course, that will impact financially uh, with, with, within restaurants. So um, uh, on, on the other end, you know, borders are still closed. Um, you, are, you, are able, you, are, you are able to go every, everywhere within the country. Um, the, 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 the healthcare system um, uh, in terms of uh, was never really under pressure. There was always, especially for people who, who, who required more intense care. So intense care was, was never under really serious pressure. So they were able to manage that well uh, on, on that space. Uh, that's, you know, but uh, of, of we are testing people um, more and more, trying to identify focus of, of COVID. Um, in, in, in many different, uh, when they are able to identify a, a case, so testing, uh, and, that, and that also resulted in, in, the, in the number of cases have, have been going up over the last uh, couple of, couple of, of weeks. Um, but you know, in, in internally, government are advising people to do uh, uh, their holidays uh, within the country uh, as much uh, as possible and in about uh, we, had, we had a few holidays uh, on the first on the first weeks of june and and uh, the countryside of portugal uh, the, the hotels they were able to finally recover a, a little bit because they got a lot of uh, uh, people who decided to go to the, to the countryside and then they improved the number of people who were you know experiencing and getting out uh, for those hotels that in the past uh, they were they were uh, occupied mainly by by uh, by tourists that's more more or less uh, uh, where we are uh, i'm still at home i don't plan to go out uh, like i used to do in the past i'm staying in my area because you know it's it's still very unpredictable And even within the UK, we have a very mixed picture. So uh, we have devolved government in uh, Scotland and uh, Northern Ireland and Wales, and each of them are choosing a slightly different path to, to coming out of lockdown to the Westminster government, uh, which is, is making the rules for England. And so um, if anything, they're much more cautious and that's probably a sensible thing. Uh, I think that, that uh, there's this pressure politically to open stuff up because of the economic cost, um, plus certain you know, ideologies favor certain, you know, one way or the other. So uh, uh, that's happening. Um, but we've got this interesting thing where the high streets opened this week. So people were queuing up to go clothes shopping, but the kids aren't at school. So we haven't managed to get our kids back to school for the most part, but we are opening up clothes shops. 
we're consuming. Uh, yeah. Capitalism know, well, at all cost. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, but like Antonio says, the restaurants aren't open. They're talking about pubs and, and so on opening again soon. But some of them may never because it becomes, it's not economically viable to run a business at 30, 40% capacity. Yes. which right. is what the distancing will require. Um, and you either distance or you risk spreading. And so there's this whole debate about whether or not you, you risk the spread or not. Um, and we're getting into the harsh realities of the debate about, you know, uh, whether we're doing the distancing to say, which generation are we protecting? Because um there is a cost to this whichever way we do this uh if we protect the the the, the frail uh the elderly uh people with disabilities who are high risk uh there is also a downside for the future economic uh, prospects of all of the, the the young people in the country there is no right way of doing this i, I obviously you know, the, the stuff that's gone on with care homes and, and the way that we've talked about people with disabilities and, and, and framed them as expendable is, is just not right. But there's still all of this potential future damage to come. So I think there's, you know, a huge amount of chaos yet to, to sort of unravel in, in our economy. So I'm not I can't say I'm looking forward to that. I, I, I do hope that because everyone knows that we're going to have to do stuff differently, that it means that our business leaders need to be brave because I think uh, we can't necessarily rely on our political leaders to do the right thing. So maybe we need our business leaders to be, be brave and start taking decisions about how they're going to help build back in a in a better more inclusive way and and we've seen some of that we've seen some of that and uh, uh, particularly you know in the reactions to the other stuff that's happened around black lives matter companies are taking action mm -hmm. you know I, I heard something that actually chilled me and i i um i wanted to stop listening to this uh, i'm a big fan of youtube videos and i um I heard that it was a sort of a conspiracy theory of a well-known leader, but he said that one thing that he sees happening is that because of these lockdowns, the mom and pop restaurants, the, you know, the family restaurants that a lot of us really try to go to, I don't want to go to a chain. Sorry. I don't want to go to a chain. The food always tastes the same. A lot of times it's cold. It's more expensive. I, I don't want to, and I'm a fan of corporations or I'm becoming less of a fan these days, but, um, but what's going to happen, all of the mom and pop restaurants, they're just going to get wiped out. We're expecting 60, I mean, 50% of our small businesses are going to fail in the, in the United States in the next six months. And, um, and they predict that what's going to happen, they're not going to be any of these family restaurants, little mom and pop restaurants, which we love. Uh, instead, it's going to be all corporate chains that survive. And that, when I heard it, it just, it made me so sad. Um, I also saw a statistic that I was, <clears throat> I was puzzled by because once again, I don't know what information from any of our regular sources we can trust. And so I was looking at CDC and they were saying the, the amount of people that have died in, in the United States to COVID-19, I would have thought that it would be our African American community because we know they are being disproportionately hit. But actually, when I looked at the statistics that yesterday on the CDC, the um, the white population, the Caucasian population, is the highest, um, and then the next one is our Latin Americans because 20% of Americans are Latin America, 15 to 20%. Um, and then the third one is African Americans. And not that any of these are good, and that's not looking at it. Very interesting looking at from age, because they also had the age, and more of our younger people have gotten it than our older people, which maybe would give me hope that we're trying to protect our older people and people with disabilities. But I see that most of people with disabilities, 
and elderly that have aged into disabilities like my husband, we're taking we're taking it in our own hands to protect him. Like my son came over today, which I haven't seen in you know a while, and he was wearing a mask. And I said, Kevin, you don't need to wear a mask. And he said, Yes, I do, Mom. Yes, I do, because I am not. I am not going to expose Dad to anything. No. So I. <clears throat> Not about my son. What a good son. But I, I also wonder how all this. So you look at that statistic of most of our, you know, our family restaurants, as we call them, we call them mom and pop restaurants in the U.S. are going to fail. And we know the U.S. is printing money to buy. It, it's interesting when David was saying, you know, we're we're poor. We can, we can't just print money. And by the way, the rest of the world doesn't want the U.S. print money either. That's not, but that's a whole nother thing I won't go get into. But I think it, it's fascinating because some countries, and um, Antonio was the first person I think that told me this, and then I'd heard it, I think from Ricardo Garcia in Spain, that some country, and Antonio, you're the first one that told me this. And I, and I don't know if this is still true, but entrepreneurship was not really encouraged in Portugal. And it, you actually told me, long time ago, you told me that not only is it, discouraged but if you do become an entrepreneur and you fail it's held against you for years and i was like what because i'm in the u.s where we encourage entrepreneurship it is, it is. so i wonder how those things are making things harder also and i'd like maybe both you no you no that 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 makes that makes things uh, uh difficult and no um uh, this might not so, not sound uh, related but uh uh, I was being uh, re reflecting uh, on banking and and all that because some of, some of the business, uh, no, they were not getting enough support from banks during this period. So the government had to force and to put some measures in place to make sure that business were get, able to get some credit, able to get to, to some loans in order to to continue few, to pay to pay some debt that they, uh, that they had, uh, and sometimes to, to employees, but to, for, for rents. And, and I started to, to realize that you know, digital has transformed banking a lot in the last couple of years. But those who are in banking today, digital is something completely new for them. This new reality of uh, digital transactions. Now, if you were if you were in university you know in 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 the 90s this model it was not something that you have to deal with and then i went to look at some of the curriculums of universities uh, who are pretty much focused on finance and banking and this new dynamics of digital and international transactions and using apps is not really something that is practice and part of the programs so I think we face a challenge that people who are in banking, they don't, they don't have the information, the skills, and the talent to deal with the complexities of, of finance, of, of the digital economy. And, and I see this as a, a, a big problem that affects everyone, but affects mostly uh, small business, who often are not very well understood by banks who prefer to big investments and i think this have a, a, a huge impact on the economy because the small business are the ones who make uh, uh, you know the economy of a country alive in, in a in a small town somewhere in the countryside of the united states costa rica uk or, or portugal you know well, I mean, we talk about all of the big corporations, but uh, the biggest contribution to our economy is is small business, and um, you know, it's these uh, you know, mom and pop businesses that that are the lifeblood of all of our economies because um, you know, they're they're generating you know maybe a one or two jobs. They're paying for themselves. They're paying for their their pensions and everything else. So yes, we have these large organizations, but, but they're not actually what drives the bulk of our economy. It's, it's, it's these small businesses. Um, I take your point about the, the, you know, the, the pedagogy being well behind the reality of, of how we're living our lives and doing business right now. But also when we think about small businesses, most people who have a disability 
who are employed are employed either as owners of small businesses or by small businesses. So if it's the small businesses that are being affected disproportionately by the economic effects of COVID, then that effect is magnified on the, the population of persons with disabilities. So we have to also think about that as an, uh, an effect of, of COVID, which is again, you know, really, really uh, unfortunate. And we have to think about how we can you know, support those businesses. There's been the... The, the lifeblood. The, yeah, absolutely. But not just that. There's been a call out to you know, support you know, b black and minority ethnic owned businesses. You know, again, we need to be supporting you know, our community's businesses too. And you know, the intersectional, you know, black disabled businesses that, you know, again, you know, we, we, we are an intersectional community and you know, we, but we need to support that. And I think that we need to highlight the great things that they do, the contribution to society and, and uh, figure out ways of helping them get past this, this tricky time. I mean, what's the case like in, in, um, in, in Costa Rica right now for small businesses? How are they, how are they surviving? Well, I, I don't think they, they're doing very well. The government did did take action with banks as, as they did in Portugal to to try to get banks to not not request payment for at least three months for some of the loans that they had. But Costa Rica has has been modeled economically very much like the United States. And that's a bad idea, of course, because we don't have the size or the power of the United States. But in general, what that means for small businesses is that they are highly leveraged. All of the things that they have come from loans. Mm -hmm. And that means that they are owned by banks, basically. Everything that they do basically goes out to banks to pay for the loans that they got to actually start the business. So. Starting a business in Costa Rica is hard, as you might know, it's papers upon papers upon papers that you have to deliver to the government to have permission to operate on any sort of business that you want to create. That takes time, that takes money. But also starting the business is not something that many people are willing to do because it is simply too hard to, to cover the social costs of actually owning a business because we have we have a very robust robust healthcare system right it it exists and it's very good for 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 what we're living right now but that of course costs a lot for business owners they have to pay i think it's 70 percent on top of what they pay people to the government to support that healthcare system it's our social security system it's not bad but it's incredibly difficult for small businesses to, to, to grow or to actually just stay alive in the context of COVID. No, uh, and let, uh, uh, something that, uh, that was happening in Portugal is, you know, you, you have to, you know, you pay, you regularly pay your taxes to, to, to government, but, but sometimes you do services for government and mm -hmm. government doesn't pay you in time. And that was happening in, in Portugal, so where government was owning, uh, was not paying to some of the, the, the companies that was providing service to them, but they were demanding this business to pay them taxes. So, so, and, and so some, some, some groups of, uh, of associations who deal with small business, they were asking government, just give me a credit about in relation to what you own me for uh, and that I'll have that as a credit for not to pay that as taxes. So the, the, they, were, they were trying that, but the government, uh, this is something that they try in the past, but government didn't bother the idea. They were not able to, to get that to pass. It's true that government tried to find ways to be more agile in terms of payments, that were, but they were always uh, uh, a kind of a delay in, ter in, ter in terms of those payments. 
And yeah. David, David, did you find that um, like in other countries that people, I mean, I think it's a really good point that Neil brought up because the reality is often people with disabilities are entrepreneurs because they haven't been very welcomed in the workforce. And even though we have made some strides, I still see gigantic brands bragging about, oh, we're inclusive and you know they've hired five people so i um and once again i'm not saying corporations are the problem they're not but <clears throat> it's it's interesting to see who's really committed to inclusion i mean i see all these amazing companies putting out all this stuff about back black lives matter and here's authors here's small businesses the black <clears throat> america african american owners i think that's all great but <clears throat> It's a little, excuse me, it's, uh, I'm sorry that it took this for them to be paying attention to that, but I think it's a good point that Neil brought up that we need to be really celebrating our business owners with disabilities and all the intersectionality too. But it's, is that something that you've also seen in Latin America and that the people with disabilities that wanted to work, they, they felt they were on their own and the family started their own business. And I was just wondering if that's also something you saw in in Latin yeah. America. Yeah. So that I, I think that's, that's the case here in Latin America as well, but it's the businesses that are owned by people with disabilities are because that person with a disability was part of a family that had the economic advantage in life because right. th there's a very strong link in Latin America between disability and poverty. Like a lot of people who are, who have disabilities in Latin America, are also poor. So they don't have access to education and that lack of access to education means lack of access to opportunities in general. So th there's like that double exclusion going on. Yeah, and, and uh, I think one of the things that we quite often forget even in, in our, um, our own countries is that a lot of the uh, entrepreneurs are also coming from the the sort of affluent classes. Uh, so they are starting from a position where they've had privilege, they've had education, they've had, you know, financial support. You know, we celebrate people like Richard Branson, like Stelios, Haji Ayanu, who started their airlines and all of these multiple businesses. But, uh, yeah. Stelios didn't come from grinding poverty. His father was a shipping magnate. Richard Branson's father was a judge. This is not people that have, uh, you know, had to struggle and suffer terribly um, before, before, you know, starting their business. So, you know, it's no, no disrespect to them. They've done an amazing job with their businesses, but there, there are these various different starting points. Yeah. They haven't started from zero, you know, um, and, and, you know, as David's just pointing out, actually many of the people with disabilities are starting from zero because disability often is equated with, you know, poor economic circumstances. And it's almost like a symbiotic thing where you've got, um, you, you know, disability uh, is more likely to happen if you're poor and you're more likely to be poor if you're disabled so you've got that double double hit yeah yeah and, and that that happens for many for multiple reasons right there's the social exclusion of people with disabilities in general but there's also the fact that usually to take care of people with disabilities one family member has to not work so that affects also the, the, yeah. the economic capabilities of that family so yeah governments need to take action to to actually support people with disabilities in many different ways to give them the same sort of starting point yeah as and, everyone and, else. and this in in these current times many uh, parents with kids with disabilities they have to they have to stay at home uh, with them uh, because they need to take care of them because the, the 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 places where they could stay they, they could have stay for the day while they were at work are closed down uh, mm -hmm. At the same time, if they were doing any kind of, a, of therapy, they can't go to hospitals because basically COVID takes almost a huge amount of resources. So mm -hmm. this is something that is also happening. So if a child was on, on any kind of therapy on the last three months, there was no therapy. If you were 
add a kind of a urgent uh, uh, operation, that operation was not taking place because uh, the resources were were all on COVID, and I've seen that uh, happening in, in in Portugal in the some in the and in a number of, of situations. Uh, and sometimes governments they don't really cr uh, they don't create measures uh, to assure the rights of people with disabilities. They just do that for the general population. They don't really look at uh, this population as okay. How can we take care? Or considering the dynamics that are happening now, how can we how can we find a way to minimize the impact in their lives? You know how can you know, and I haven't seen um, any government doing that. Yes. David, I know we're almost out of time, so let's let, let's let you have the final words and then turn it over to Neil so he can uh, thank our supporters. But it's a great conversation. Yeah, and it, it feels like we're getting out of time a little early because there's a lot of things that we could talk about. But it's, it, I think we've been going through the reality and the reality right now is very worrying and we are all very scared. And of course it gets us down, but there's also the fact that this crisis has put our governments and us as well in, in a place of actual possibility for change I think there there's a big possibility for for progress in many different levels of society I've seen in Costa Rica just as an example laws pass in a week that never happened in our parliament and, and, and that just means that there's that possibility to create things that actually help people yeah. there just needs to be that will around what we're doing yeah, I, I sincerely hope that, that the work that we do uh, enables us to create that, that better society. So as Deborah says, I need to thank the people that kindly support us every week to, to stay on air, to stay captioned. So thank you to Barclays Access, Microlink, and to My Clear Text. You guys all rock. And I hope that uh, everyone will join us on Tuesday for a lively Twitter chat. Thank yes. You. Thank you, David. Thank you, guys.